Many have heard of the Great Firewall, China's ongoing effort to limit and control what internet content is accessible within its borders. But there has also been a multi-decade campaign to change how the internet actually works at the protocol level in favor of China's interests. Take this abomination. A new protocol and addressing system researchers have called IPv9. Even worse are changes that if go into effect dramatically tip the balance of privacy and control ever deeper in favor of nation states and internet service providers, allowing absolute control over who and how individuals can transmit data and what content can be accessible across the whole internet, not just within the borders of China. Thankfully, they're not in effect, and the internet runs on a set of open and universal standards everywhere. At its core is TCP IP. These protocols allow an Argentinian MacBook to connect to a router from Finland and a network-connected printer from North Korea. Specifically, the internet protocol defines how we do routing, how data knows where to go, and how we get IP addresses. There are two main versions running the internet today, IPv4, with IP addresses most of you are familiar with, and IPv6, which we're transitioning to mainly because we've run out of version 4 addresses. I get more into details in my video about the long-forgotten IPv5, so you can check that out if you would like. Now, the addresses I showed earlier is what was referred to as IPv9, would isolate networks from the rest of the global internet completely. Not to mention, it's just ugly. Makes IPv6 hexadecimal notation, dare I say, elegant in comparison. Some have argued that the multiple attempts by researchers in China to have their own versions of the IP stack is ultimately less about the technical limitations of the current protocols and more about political concerns. Who sets these protocols? Who controls them? And what rights does China have over its own digital sovereignty? All questions that can be answered a lot more easily and simply by building their own internet from scratch. In the 1990s, economically re-emerging China got access to the internet, but faced a problem. The internet was created by American institutions, standards bodies were mostly Western engineers, and the governing bodies allocating scarce IPv4 addresses and managed important root domain servers were controlled by the US government. Adding fuel to the fire were rumors that China was paying the United States government just to access the internet. Although later debunked, many in China felt that the internet was of American origin and still controlled by the United States. So they proposed a counter, make their own internet, starting with protocols of Chinese origin. Insert IPv9. IPv9 was first mentioned in a 2001 paper and patent with two parts. First is a way to do routing with phone numbers, mostly a modified DNS server attempting to tackle the perceived risk that the US controlled ICANN would cut off China from DNS. This fear grew because of rumors that the United States removed Iraq's.iq domain from the internet before the 2003 Iraq invasion. Now, the reality of the .iq domain was far more complicated and weird, involving the domain manager being imprisoned in Texas, all probably a topic for another video. But this DNS via phone numbers made it possible to do DNS without US controlled root servers being in the loop. Second, these papers proposed a straight competitor to IPv6. IPv9 was ultimately similar, had a few of era buzzword features, but importantly promised more addresses. With Chinese researchers believing IPv6 wasn't big enough, which, as we've discussed in other videos, we shouldn't run out of these in even our, our great grandkids' lifetimes. The problem was, although these were just fringe proposals, early IPv9 documentation made it seem already implemented and in use throughout China. Forcing reoccurring character on this channel, Vint Cerf, one of the chief architects of the modern internet, to email senior figures in the Chinese internet community, asking, as far as I know, INA has not allocated the IPv9 designation to anyone. IPv9 is not an internet standard. Could you please explain what is intended here? I'm disturbed by the reference to root servers and control. Vint Cerf was noting IPv9 was not allocated by the standard body IANA, the technical arm of ICANN, and pushing back, I'm guessing, on the premise that US controlled the DNS root servers. China's attempt at forcing their own standards backfired, though, and the Chinese government backed away from IPv9 for almost 15 years. When it returned in the late 2010s through a series of papers and patents again, it came with a slew of new buzzwords, you know, Internet of Things, Blockchain, Digital Currencies, Smart Cities, because of course it did. This time there was also promotional material with uh, fun sensationalized quotes like internet engineers focused on promoting IPv6 but didn't spend enough research on how to fundamentally solve the internet's core problems. I mean, it doesn't explain what the core problems are. 
and we can never create Chinese sovereignty on version 4 and version 6 foundations. Interesting. Now, we actually get a lot more technical information from this series of IPv9 papers and documents. We can see things like what addresses would look like, how it would work independently of IP version 4 and 6, and what capabilities were theorized here. But again, due to the lack of standards bodies buy in and the economic risks of creating a separate internet just for China, it went nowhere. Actually worse, it evolved to be bait for scammers. Fraudsters use the idea of IPv9 to convince people to get in before it's too late to buy IPv9 domains or whatever, before China's servers severed its ties from the US backed internet before presumably the prices go up. I don't really get the scam, but it's it's kind of fun reading, you know, kooky uncle scam texts in other languages. One of the great human experiences, I guess, is the, the pyramid scheme. Although this seemingly killed talk about IPv9, it didn't kill China's attempt to change internet protocols. Around the same time, the late 2010s, backed by Huawei, they proposed new IP. New IP was far more dangerous than IPv9. Instead of saying, we're building a Chinese internet, they said, we're improving the internet for everyone. The marketing was better too, selling a future world of better gaming, industrial automation, enhanced security, and holograms, apparently. But to deliver these improvements, new IP would fundamentally break how the internet works. First, it would make the network smart. Today's IP just delivers packets without caring about content. New IP wanted packet headers to include user identity and content information. Your ISP wouldn't just deliver your data, they'd know exactly who you are and what you're doing. Second, it promised guaranteed performance by abandoning best effort networking. Sounds great, but implementing guarantees across the global internet would add massive complexity. And even worse, give network operators, again, ISPs and nation states, dangerous power over whose traffic gets prioritized. The result of these proposals would be perfect infrastructure for surveillance and control. Instead of blunt internet shutdowns, governments can surgically block individuals from transmitting certain data or accessing certain sites. This would be far more surgical than what China does today with the Golden Shield Project, or also known as the Great Chinese Firewall. Even worse would give more tools to other countries and powerful organizations in the middle of the chain, like ISPs and, and backbone providers. Now, when the original proposals were rejected in 2019-2020, proponents got clever. They broke new IP into smaller pieces and started submitting them separately across different organizations, specifically targeting the UN's International Telecommunications Union, which is odd because the ITU is not normally the organization that makes determinations on this part of the internet stack. It's the IETF where we get the famous RFCs we talk about regularly on this channel and where decisions about TCP, IP, and the core networking protocols we use today are crafted and decided. Decisions are made by technical consensus. The best technical arguments usually win, regardless of country. The ITU operates completely differently. It's a UN agency where every country gets a vote, regardless of technical experience. China has the same voting power as the United States and has wielded significant control over the ITU by building voting blocks of other countries. So while China proposals might get shot down by engineers in the IETF for being technically problematic, they can frame the same proposals in ITU as you know, research and developing countries' needs or digital sovereignty requirements and get much more favorable reception, potentially creating deeper conflicts between these organizations. Unlike IPv9, which was clearly a Chinese alternative, new IP is presented as an evolution of our shared internet that makes it far more dangerous. We're not talking about separate networks anymore, but potentially transforming the global internet into something with built-in surveillance capabilities. But here's the thing, this isn't really about technology. IPv9 and new IP are symptoms of a larger struggle over who controls the digital spaces where we live our lives. Today's internet, for all its flaws, was built on principles of openness and end-to-end -end connectivity. It's dumb by design. The fight over the internet protocol is really a fight over the future of human communication. Will it be open or controlled, free or surveilled? Oh yeah, I've been baiting you all video by capitalizing the V and IPv9 incorrectly, but this is actually how it's formatted in the research documentation, even next to IPv4 and IPv6 with the correct format. It's because there was already a different IPv9. 
Two of them, actually. One was an unrelated IETF proposal as an alternative to IPv6 called Tuba, TCP, and UDP with bigger addresses. It was proposed to run over TCP and UDP in a connectionless mode network protocol. Although it didn't gather much steam, it turned into a different protocol, ISIS, is, is, I don't know. It's still in use today. There is a other more famous IPv9 from the early 90s, and it was an April Fool's Day joke. RFC 1606 from April 1st, 1994 was titled An Historical Perspective on Usage of IP Version 9. The RFC is written as if IP Version 9 had already been deployed, used widely, and then abandoned due to terrible design flaws. It described IPv9 as using 42-byte address format, which would give you more possible addresses than there are atoms in the observable universe. So when Chinese researchers started calling their protocol IP version 9 in the 2000s, they were unknowingly naming it after an elaborate internet joke, which honestly makes the whole thing even more bizarre. Some explanations of the early Chinese IP version 9 implementations and commentary even show confusion with the April Fool's RFC, with specs from the joke RFC appearing in the tech specs of the Chinese IPv9 such as the 42-byte address format and 42-deep hierarchical of routing levels, are often conflated and seem suspiciously similar. Some rough reports I found say the V for version was later capitalized because it was a better version than all that came before, but I also think it has to do with keeping it separate from this joke. 